Welcome to the Smart Dating Academy podcast. I'm Bella Gandhi, the founder of Smart Dating Academy and your host. I started Smart Dating Academy in 2009 because I had this crazy knack of giving people dating advice that actually worked, that I took. I've been married for almost 25 years, and now my company helps people to date smarter and to find love. This podcast is meant to bring more love into your life no matter where you are and what you do and we're here to bring more life into your love smart daters welcome back to the podcast i couldn't be more excited to have today's guest dr alexandra solomon on the podcast again there's very few people i've had on for a second (laughs) time but alexandra is that special And what's particularly exciting about this time right now is that she has written an amazing new book called Love Every Day, 365 Relational Self-Awareness Practices to Help Your Relationship Heal, Grow, and Thrive. Alexandra, I cannot wait to talk about this book and you. Welcome to the Smart Dating Academy podcast. Welcome back. I love that I'm in the two timers club. Not I'm not two timing, but I'm here for a second time. I think that's so fun. I feel you, very, very loved. <laughs> well, you are very loved. And goodness gracious, you are a prolific everything professor, therapist, and author. So tell us about what was your inspiration for your third book? Mm, this, I'm really excited about this third book. I'm excited to be talking to you about it. I'm excited to be telling your smart daters about it because I think it really is the, it's a, it's a wonderful book to have when you're in relationship, but it's a really wonderful book to have when you're between relationships because coming out of a relationship is preparing for your next relationship, dipping a toe in the water into a next relationship. Those are times that are so ripe for holding up that mirror and looking at who you know, who you are as a person, where you come from, your beliefs, your fears, your hopes uh, for intimate partnerships. So that that is really what we're doing in this book. It is unlike kind of a chapter book. This is just a 365. Like you pick it up, you read a little and you put it down till the next day or the next week because you have it, you know, it's, it's a year's worth of little micro lessons, but you can have it for as many years as you like. And I have always loved a 365 book. I think they're just really like manageable and doable. And uh, so I'm excited to be able to put one out into the world that is designed to really reflect how all of our healing journeys go, which is, it's not like you have one big insight about your past or about your patterns. And then that puts the puzzle piece into place and everything falls in and you just are happily ever after. It's the little practices. It's the little check-ins with self. It's the little you know, question that you ask your partner a bit differently that opens up a different conversation. So this book reflects that idea that we grow and we shift and we change and we heal in little baby steps. And it's never fixed. It's always growing, whether it's a relationship (laughs) with yourself or a relationship with an existing partner or a new partner, it is growing and evolving all the time, or ideally it should be. That's right. Because life is not ever going to stop being so darn lifey, you know, like it's just going to keep right. Even if I thought I understood and I understand myself pretty darn well, right. I've got diaries that go back to when I was 15 years old and, you know, trying to make sense of who I was. So I've been on a a journey of self-reflection and self-inquiry for many, many years. And I'm talking to you today from my mom's house. You know, I've got this aging mama and I came into town to kind of help her get her stuff organized. I tell you what, it's kicking my butt. You know, it does not matter how many hours of therapy I've had. I am activatable. You know, I am able to be triggered and activated and challenged. And I, you know, so all of those life is going to keep giving us opportunities to check in with ourselves and really like continue to grow. So we got no choice. We may as well have the tools we need to do it. I love that. So let's use that as a diving board into this being at home. What, what, if you're willing to share, (laughs) you know, kind of what triggers you and more importantly, because we 
all have triggers from yeah. childhood, right? I mean, if you don't think you do, <laughs> newsflash, you do. You do. We all do. Even if you're very close to your family, I'm very close to my mom, my dad, my brother, but we can all, I know I can take on a certain role at mm -hmm. certain points, right? And we all flip back to that. It's like, damn it, why did I do that? Why did I say that? So is there something that you have noticed that has come up for you? Mm -hmm. And what have you been able to do with your self-awareness to help yourself through that situation? Great, yep. Okay, so in a nutshell, and this is like literally reporting from the trenches because I am- You're you know, there, you guys, I can see her in her yes. mom's house right now. That's right, that's right. It's like sideline reporting. Okay, here's what we know so far, team. Um, I have a long history of just being my mom's right-hand person, being her confidant, being her soft place to land. And so there's really, there's, there's a long history of sort of nothing I won't do for her but also getting, ex you know, sort of exhausting myself in the process and feeling kind of the, the rise of, um, you know, sort of like, like, like almost, I think what happens when we give too much or so much is we can sort of lose touch with how we feel inside of our own bodies. And so yeah. we, you know, I am, we're on a kind of a cleaning, organizing blitz right now. And so I feel that little girl part of me that is just like, can keep going, you know, just keep pushing through. But I think what's different now is I'm stepping away. I'm getting a snack. I'm getting some air, you know, so I'm no, I'm just trying to kind of stay connected to my body. And also I think I, I have what I didn't have as a little girl, which is just the capacity to kind of see this whole thing from a, from a distance and not lose myself in the way that I would have and to really feel, I'm also very in touch with like this thing that oftentimes we develop as we have aging parents, like that role, well, it's not a role reversal because it's me just taking more care of, of just her, more. but Girl, caring I'm for her, you. you know, caring for her in her in a time when she really does need care and she's got feelings, she's got feelings about needing care. Right. So there's that layer of it too. She just doesn't want to need care. And I think, my gosh, you know, 30 years from now, how will it be with my own daughter when I'm needing care? And so it's that whole like circle of life part of it, the poignancy of it that I think is what helps me stay grounded and patient and expansive through this, through this journey of paperwork and stacks of sweaters. <laughs> mm, but I love that you're listening to yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I need a break right now versus mm -hmm. I just need to be a mule because at that point, knowing yourself and knowing what you might be predilected towards versus saying, you know what? I need a snack. I need a break. Better for you, better for mom. Win, That's right. win. Amazing. So That's taking right. the time to check in with yourself. And, you know, for Alexandra, it could be being at home with your mom. For you, listener, it could be situations at work. It could be situations with your ex that you're co-parenting with. Maybe it's your adult children, right? Really checking in with yourself and thinking about what would make me better in this mm -hmm. relationship right now. Yep. 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 And staying keeping an eye on the other person's experience. This is the other thing. I think for those of us who are prone to over-functioning, it's very easy to lose sight of what the other person is experiencing. So like last night, I could have gone for three more hours and my mom was like, can we please stop? And I was like, but we have more to do, but we have. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there are two people who are doing this. And so really noticing the sort of shadowy part of your tendency. And my tendency is to over-function, you know, to keep doing. And that that's, that has the risk of making the other person feel like they're not being taken into consideration. So it's that checking in with self and checking in with others. One of my favorite relational self-awareness questions of all is that check-in where you say, how am I, how am I coming across to the other person right now? What's it like for the other person to be with me right now? Just that check in and it's not it's not beating ourselves up it's just inquiry just checking in how is my tone how's my body language am i taking feedback in or am i so you know on my own kind of a uh, you know on my own mission 
So how do you do that in the moment? Do you just stop? And let's say you're talking to your husband, Todd, or you're with a patient. Like, do you just have these little alarms set on your phone? Like, Hey, Alexandra, Mm -hmm. how am I showing up right now for this person? Like how Tell us how we can be better in those moments. Yeah, yeah. Well, I do. I mean, I think literally the number of times that I prescribe putting an alarm on your phone for X, like I've got, I can think of probably five reasons off the top of my head why putting an alarm on your phone is really helpful. And that is exactly what I would do. I would say if you're, if this is an emerging skill for you, put five alarms on your phone, you know, just throughout the day. And when that alarm goes off, you just pause and check in. Maybe you're by yourself in sort of a moot point, but you could still check in and just sort of see how you are inside of your own body, how you're talking to yourself. But certainly when one of those alarms goes off, check in about the quality of connection you're having with the person you're with, not how they're acting, but how you're acting, you know, and not again about being mean to yourself, but just developing that awareness. And I think, you know, with practice, you don't need the alarm. You just kind of learn to intuitively, you know, check in sometimes cued by the other person's feedback when they're like, Hey, I need a break or Hey, like let's, you know, pause or change topics. Sometimes we need that cue from somebody else, but we also can develop that practice of just noticing again and again. And I love that because you can notice yourself. And then I would say as a part two to that, what you could do to really, you know, test your bravery, your courage and the, the accuracy of your self mirror is to ask the person that you are with, Hey, how did you perceive me when 100%. we were having this conversation? Was yeah. I kind? Did I look receptive? Was yeah. I present? Was I empathic? And check in because sometimes what you want to make sure is there isn't a dissonance where you're like, wow, yeah, yeah I'm pretty awesome. And your partner is like, yeah, not so much. So it's good to <laughs> check in with self. And then would you agree maybe with the other person? I think that it's such it's such a hallmark of a safe and trusting relationship, whether it's a friendship or a sibling relationship or an intimate partnership, certainly is one where you can ask for feedback and the other person treats that as something really sacred rather than an opportunity to, you know, slam Put you. a knife in you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that's really, I think that's lovely. We just, we visited our daughter at college and there were different moments where we each did give each other the gentlest of feedback because we were both very excited to see her. We hadn't seen her for a few weeks. And so we had to, we gave each other a little gentle, like, Hey, slow it down. Maybe, you know, give her a little more space. Maybe. So we gave each other little bits of feedback around how we thought the other was coming across (laughs) to her because it was, you know, we're kind of developing a new dance with this college daughter of ours. And that's such a beautiful quality relationship when feedback feels like it is designed to elevate and support you rather than to cut you down or control you. Mm, I love that. And one of the things that I love in your book, Love Every Day, is I was obviously cheating and glancing towards future dates and not just looking at today. But Mm -hmm. you said that at the heart of the best romantic relationships is a really strong friendship. Mm. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I would love to know if you agree. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, I gave a TED talk probably two years ago, I guess, yeah. God, exactly, um, called The Secret to Finding Lasting Love. And it's a concept that we call identifying your elevator people, the people that really elevate you in your life and looking at why are these people, why are these my elevator people and what do they give to me that elevates me? And then looking for in your romantic partner, an elevator person with the same qualities that your elevator people have. So essentially we're hitting the heart of the same thing. It's like, you should look at your creme de la creme relationships, identify why they are that way. And why wouldn't you seek a romantic partner that elevates you in the same way? And the only difference is, okay, great. And you want to sleep with them. Awesome. Right. So, <laughs> so I love that you said that because that very much dovetails into our elevator people concept. I love the elevator people. Like it's the, um, just this morning I, w- I did a, um, NPR 
uh, really interesting conversation about trust, the science of trust, what breaks trust, how you rebuild trust. And that really is such a nugget there is like the degree to which I feel like you've got my back, the degree to which it feels like what's good for me is in the front of your mind. Not the only thing in your mind, but that you're that when you behave, when you make a choice, one of the factors is, is it good for me? Like, how is it going to affect the other person? And that's what an elevator person does, right? They want, they want what's good for you. They consider, you know, they've got your best interest at heart and they want you to shine. I think that's such a huge element, right? Is like just wanting to shine on the other person, wanting that person to shine. And that is right. It's what we want in friendships. Um, as well. And it is, it's because I think it's also very pragmatically because sexual chemistry shifts and changes and has to be cultivated. So it's really nice to have alongside chemistry or, you know, enjoyment of, of experiencing pleasure together to have alongside that a sense of, I like this person. I'm drawn to them. I enjoy giving them pleasure and receiving pleasure from them and with them. But I also just like them as a person. That's a wonderful, wonderful quality in an intimate relationship. And very, very hard to say that you're happy if you can't also say that you like your partner. That's 100% true. And in order to preserve that sexual chemistry as we go through 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years of marriage, you have to feel safe and seen in the presence of this person. And when you have that friendship where you feel safe and like the other person has your back, you can say, hey, while that used to be good for me, it isn't right now. Mm. That actually hurts and feeling safe and using language that doesn't make the other person feel badly. Like it's your fault. It may not be anybody's fault, but feeling the safety to say, well, that hurts, or I don't love that. Maybe we could do this instead. And if you don't, and people often say, well, I mean, do I have to be really good friends with this person? What about sexual chemistry? I'm like long-term in order to preserve and grow that chemistry, you, you can't do that in the absence of trust and safety. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause what is, I mean, what, what is chemistry? It's not just something like ephemeral that happens. or doesn't happen. They're probably the level at which it's about, you know, physical appearance and et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of chemistry is that right. Safety, the ability to take risks, the ability to be like playful and silly. I think that there's, I'm all for passion in a sexual experience, but lots of long-term couples also rely heavily on humor and silliness as a gateway to erotic experiences. So there's not any, there's not like right, wrong ways of getting into an erotic moment with a partner. And over 20, 30 years, as you're saying, couples need to have lots of ways of transitioning from doing dishes side by side to, you know, getting in bed together or, you know, parenting to becoming lovers again. And there needs to be lots of ways of doing that. And when you have a friendship, sometimes it's passion, but sometimes it's silliness and playfulness, you know? And so there's, there's, um, yeah, that element of friendship is, is, is vital because it creates the safety and the safety is just, yeah, you can't go anywhere without it. I love that. I'm going to see if I can flip to something I bookmarked in the book. It's about attraction and it, it, I'll probably screw it up, but you can correct me here. Basically it, you say something about how you can actually control who you're attracted to. It's April 18th. I just found it. (laughs) Attraction happens. Attraction is notoriously unruly and transgressive. You aren't the victim of your attractions. You make choices about what you do in the face of that attraction. Mic drop. Talk to us about this. Okay. So this is what some people call toxic monogamy, Mm. which is the, which is the belief that if it's true love, if this is the one, if this is your soulmate, your attraction will go in one direction, in one direction only for the rest of your gosh darn life. 
you know, that's the belief of toxic monogamy, right? Like you shouldn't, Bella's nose is scrunching up I know. Uh, for, those, for those of you who are just listening, right? But that, but that is, that's sort of the, the romanticized fairy tale belief, right? Is if I love you, I'm only, I only have eyes for you. And so what I was getting at in this April 18th post is no, attraction happens for all kinds of reasons that actually, in fact, are not really ours to understand why attraction happens, but there's a space between attraction and behavior. And in the space between action and between attraction and behavior, obviously we can make a choice of what we do with it, but we also can make a choice about the story we tell. And I, I have had so many clients who scare themselves because they notice somebody at the gym that they would not have noticed in year one of their relationship, or they feel some kind of way about a colleague that is not you know, appropriate or they wish wasn't happening. And so then they will connect the dots and say, this must mean that my partner and I are doomed. It does not have to mean that. It might mean if there's a few different things that it might mean. So take the experience of attraction as just, it just, it's happening. It's happening. And then what you do with it is a whole nother matter. It might mean that you do need to turn your attention back home. It might, it certainly means that you need to be mindful of your boundaries if you want to protect your relationship, but it doesn't have to mean gloom and doom. It can be something that you notice, but don't necessarily give a lot of attention or meaning or emphasis to. That's tell, right. me what you, tell me what you think of that. I totally agree. And I think that it, if someone says in a long-term relationship, they've never been attracted to an outside person, I'm not sure they might be telling the truth or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're not telling the truth to themselves more importantly. Yeah. And I think that if you find yourself in that situation, right, you feel the attraction. The first thing to do, like you said, is you check in with yourself and say, what's happening here and yeah. why? Yeah. Why is it, wow, I'm really compelled by this person at work because they elevate me at mm -hmm. work. They've told my boss how amazing I am. They give me accolades. They see me mm -hmm. and the hard work I'm doing. And so that might be the mirror for you to say, wow, maybe I'm not feeling super seen at work or in other aspects of my life. Wonderful. Yep. 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 And Maybe I'm not offering that to myself enough. Maybe I'm outsourced. I be, I've become too reliant on somebody else's affirmation of me because I'm not offering that to myself enough. But yeah, certainly, I mean, that's one of the, I think that's just such a big challenge is that the part of ourselves that gets expressed at work is, you know, can be different than the part of ourself that gets expressed at home. And, you know, domesticity, like building a life with somebody and like, you know, sharing a bathroom with some brushing your teeth side by side with somebody for many, many years. Right. It, it is, it's a really different expression of who we are in that context versus ourself at work. And so it makes sense that some that we may feel, you know, kind of ambitious and creative and alive and, you know, on our toes at work in a way that we aren't at home. So we have to be really mindful of the fact that it doesn't necessarily mean that that person at work is the end all be all, but who am I being in this moment? What part of me gets to be expressed here that isn't being expressed at home? And how, how might I be able to be a bit more alive at home? How might I share a little more of my creativity or ambition with my partner and ask for some more time and space to do that? Yeah, I love that. And, and if you're feeling, oh my gosh, I'm just excited, then that's a sign that you might just need some new excitement in your life. And one of the easiest ways to do that is do something new with your partner, right? Mm -hmm. And take a dance class, learn to play poker together, do something that you yeah. want to do together that is new to both of you. I right. And mm -hmm. you get that novelty again, where you both feel like beginners and you're yeah. a little, you know, not sure footed. In mm. that. So, so I think fun. that, yeah, it's mm -hmm. super fun to do together. So really checking in with yourself again, self-awareness and is, is everything. Why am I feeling this way? What is the draw to this person? And it doesn't mean that I am now not in love with my partner, right? Or it might be, or mm -hmm. it might mm -hmm. just be, you have to ask yourself, what, why is this happening? What is this bringing up? Right. And not necessarily, 
agree to go have a drink with this person that you're feeling some sort of something, something with, because then in that space between attraction and behavior, that's where we can get some <laughs> dark side. <laughs> Yes. And that is, I mean, every story, you know, I've, I've heard many, many, many stories of infidelity, you know, in my years of practice and that infidelity does not happen. It's not a light switch. It's a series of little boundary violations. You know, it doesn't go from like nothing to a full blown affair like that. It is a series of little transgressions. And it's sort of the, the way in which, you know, sort of people make excuses of it's not that big of a deal or it's not, but that's what it's that it's that way you feel in your gut where you know you're playing with fire. You know that if your partner were to watch the videotape of this interaction, they'd be like, uh, babe, something is something's amiss here. So, yeah. It's funny. I remember doing some segments on TV a couple of years ago and they were calling it micro cheating. Uh -huh. What is micro cheating, right? It's wow. You know, the new CFO is a real smoke show. So if I find myself wanting to wear my really cute form-fitting red dress. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> right? And so that's, yeah. you know, and, and you can play that one of two ways. Like, oh, I just want to look really nice mm -hmm. because I'm a woman and why not? It's okay mm -hmm. to be that way, right? Or it could really mean something, like you're trying yeah. to draw his attention. And that's really where it's important. And there's no judgment around that. But ask yourself, why do I want to wear the red dress? Uh -huh. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, what am I looking for? Am I yeah. just looking to be noticed and an accolade and that's it? And hoping somebody will say, wow, you look really pretty today. Right. Or right. right. Am I hoping for an invitation to go grab a drink with? The yeah. Is there one pair of eyes that I'm particularly orienting to? Amen. So mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Micro cheating versus macro cheating. And people, yeah. you know, one of the questions that the anchors asked and which you hit on beautifully was how do you know if you mm. are, or you're not like, what are you doing? The question to ask yourself, if I saw my partner doing the same thing Great. I yeah. just did, then, you know, you're within scope or out of scope. That's and right. usually for most people that <laughs> brings on this look of Oh shit. Okay. Now I know that is yeah. the ultimate check-in ladies right. and gentlemen is That's ask right. yourself, would I be okay with that text? Would I yeah. be okay with that email? Would I be okay with the red dress? And if yeah. the answer is yeah, no, then you were definitely uh, heading down yeah. that slippery slope. Yep. And it's, there's, you know, it's not totally our fault that we will cut ourselves slack that we wouldn't cut our partner. It's called in psychology, it's called the fundamental attribution error. Like we make fundamental attribution errors. We have much more generous stories about ourselves. Like we, people who are kind of on that slippery slope or playing with fire will make all kinds of excuses to kind of be like, it's not that big of a deal, or I've got this, or that's not what I'm doing, like inside their own heads in a way that they never, ever would do if it was their partner. So just knowing that, that we are all at risk of cutting ourselves slack or being in denial or playing with edges that we wouldn't, you know, offer the same to a partner if they were behaving in those ways. Right. So that's really the ultimate check-in is yeah. check in with yourself. To yeah. See, is this micro cheating. I love that word because it's so, it's so descriptive. Yeah. You know, and people get it. And it, it, that's, it is in the age of technology, right? It's super easy to have all kinds of ways of pushing, you know, pushing little envelopes. And, and I think what's so sneaky about it is that I think you imagine that if you got quote unquote caught, you could be like, but that's not cheating, but that's not cheating. But, you know, if you really do kind of quiet down and have those ways that you check in with yourself, check in with your body, your body knows, you know, your body knows when you're, when you're out of integrity, it does. Wait, can I ask you, I want to ask you one question about something we were saying before. Sure. We were talking about couples having new experiences together and kind of being novices together. Do you also like experience-based dates, like in early dating, like rather than sitting down across from a beer or across from a cup of coffee, like, do you like people on dates to be out doing something? I love for people to do something as basic as taking a walk together on a first date. Hmm. 
right? So much data show that we tend to have more vulnerable, authentic conversations when we're side by side Instead with somebody face face. versus mm-hmm. straight on strangers' eyes boring right into you. So, so you've got the side by side thing going on when you're walking and you also have movement, yeah. right? And what does that do? probably lowers your anxiety also. Mm -hmm. And you have all these contextual things that you can talk about. Wow. Look at that crazy squirrel, you know, Uh look at the guy selling streetwise, right? There's all these things that can make conversation seem so organic and natural. So I love something as basic as a walk for Mm -hmm. first dates, right? And you don't Mm -hmm. have to like go and play ping pong or play pickleball or do something that, you know, you might not be comfortable with doing, you might injure yourself. And that turns into a zero sum game. It's a win lose thing, right? Because then it's like, mm-hmm. well, God, do I let her win or do I let him win? Or yeah, I'm good at this, right? So so take all that off the table here. Just go for a walk. It's <gasps> so easy and so simple and so underrated. I love that so much because walking is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite ways to spend time with anybody, my siblings, my friends, Todd, my ki- our kids. My gosh, I am such a walker. So I love I love that you're bringing, that you are challenging us, inviting us to date walks. I'm Day here. Walks. I'm so here for it. And way before this had to be like 20 years ago, way before I had started Smart Dating Academy, I was still a manufacturing girl. I remember reading an article in maybe the Tribune talking about why couples in Sweden have a lower rate of divorce than many, many other industrialized countries. So I read it with intrigue and yeah. it said after dinner, they have a ritual of going out for a walk together. And so there's obviously salutary health benefits to this, but they could go and just talk about the day with no prescribed agenda. And so Andy and I used to call them back in the day, even pre-kids, we let's, let's go on an MBW, a marriage bonding walk. And so we still use that acronym today. Like, let's go on an MBW. When I want to bond with my kids, either with my son, we're in a car. Side by side. side, by side. Mm-hmm. That's when I get the tea from yeah. him. Tea is yeah. gossip. And with my daughter, we go on walks. And during yes. COVID, it's like, oh my gosh, Ugh. I miss our walks so desperately when she's at school. So yes, walking guys is so underrated. And it is a great activity date that doesn't have to take you into a level of I win, you lose. Right. That's right. That's right. That's great. It's a great way also to have a sober date for, you know, for people who are just like wanting to not even get involved with that. Like the win, I I hear you on the win, on the win lose. I don't, that is um, when my husband and I do things that are competitive, it really does shut me down. Like that is not playing Yahtzee or something is not going to lead to sex in my house. (laughs) This is not a turn on for me. I don't like that vibe. And so I imagine if I was dating, I would not do well with that vibe. And there are, there's lots of dynamics around it and kind of that. Yeah kind of icky feeling. So walking dates, Uh walking dates and walking with friends. I know you and I have Lauren Stryker in common and Lauren is a very dear friend. And when she would say, Oh, do you want to grab lunch? I'm like, actually, would you like to go for a walk or get a manicure? I said, I'm trying to work on my weight and manage it. And she's like, this is so much better. So I know one day we did a pie was on her podcast. And she said, this is my friend who I talked to you about, who said, we don't need to meet for lunch. We don't meet need to meet for dinner. Let's do an activity together and still spend time together without adding to our waistlines. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So you can do these things with mm-hmm. friends as well. And remember guys, the goal of a date is to find places to connect, not yeah. necessarily to disconnect because it's far more fun to connect with somebody. Yeah. And even, even if somebody says something that you don't like, instead of going into war mode, right? Yeah. And saying, I disagree right? To me, two of the most evil words together in the human language, I disagree. What do you do? You shut the other person down. It's like, huh, 
That's so interesting. What makes you think that, uh -huh. right? And engaging somebody in a conversation, right? And we had all of these debates in the dating world during COVID. There's people that got the vaccine and then there's people that I, didn't want yeah. the vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. And there, it's like, so instead of saying, oh my God, never, ever, ever, ask somebody's experience as to why they were vaccinated or didn't. If you find that you diverge on that point, getting curious is so much more fun than yeah. judging and disconnecting. Yeah. Yep. And two things. One is that's going to be much easier to do if you're walking because you're not I, you know, eyes to eyes kind of boring in. And when you're, when you're moving, you, you, it's like, it's the opposite of stuckness, right? So your bodies are moving. So you, it, I think it is just like a disinhibiting thing. So that conversation is more likely to happen if you're walking. And then the second thing was about disagreeing. Oh, just that then you could you you really might decide that you are not interested in dating that person, that this is really just too significant of a values difference and you drive them crazy and they drive you crazy, but it doesn't mean you need to like, yeah, waste your energy debating it because you're probably not going to change their mind. So you could just have the dialogue and still kind of step away from the, from the relationship because it wouldn't, neither of you would be serving the other one particularly well if it feels like that central and that key of a difference for you. Exactly. You can just look at it as an opportunity and do a really quick self check-in like, okay, we're clearly different here, but can I learn two or three new things by being curious? Ooh, interesting. Right? Uh -huh. And that's such a great way to snap out of, oh, Jesus, the state's going to suck, right? Yeah. Like we totally, we, there's just no way. Instead, look at it. Okay. I'm here with this human for right. 30 more minutes. Can I learn something from this person? How can <laughs> I become better? Right. Yeah. Maybe this person, you might disconnect on the vaccine, but you might bond on the love of wine or this person right. is a total enophile, right? Look, why do they love red wines? Right. So take it as an opportunity to redirect and reconnect, if not to educate yourself on your differences. Wonderful. Yeah. Cause that's, that's not the only person in your world who sees vaccines differently. So you're going to have to, so it, it can be like a little practice, a low risk practice ground. We're not going to end up together, but let's have this conversation. And then that will help me when I have, I'm talking to whatever my mom or dad, where it is higher stakes and, you know, a, a more enduring relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, Great. let me ask you a question. You've been in private practice forever and and are so good at it. And you know, families of origins can have a profound impact on everything. We are nature, we are nurture, we mm -hmm. can watch our parents. I mean, do you think it's possible to get better at relationships? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I really do. I think that we, but not until and unless we're willing to look at all of what we bring into relationships today. Um, for sure. I mean, that is, I think that's so, none of us are ever like fixed or done. And I think it's so beautiful. I was just having a conversation the other day about, I think it's especially beautiful when I see somebody raising children, like offering the next generation, something that they didn't get, you know, like really like transforming their inheritance into a different kind of legacy. Like that's just so beautiful to be able to give to the next generation, something that you didn't get. And, you know, the things we don't get from our parents are by and large, they're not trying to hurt us. They just, they had their own set of challenges and traumas and limitations and context, you know, their context, whether they were immigrants or, you know, having to work really hard to kind of just make ends meet or struggling with addiction or the kids of addicts themselves, whatever that is, our parents parent us, you know, to the level of their awareness and to the degree of their healing during that window when they are raising us and they can keep growing. And we certainly, by looking at where they were limited, you know, we can then sort of challenge ourselves to expand and offer something quite different. And someone said this, and it might even be you, Alexander, that it, looking at, for example, your mom, not as your mom, but as your Oof. grandmother's daughter. 100%. That's my mentor, Mona Fishbane. That's where I heard that. And so I share that now. Yes. Looking at your mother as your grandmother's daughter. Yeah huge and your father is your grandfather's son like wow okay it suddenly just lends yeah. a lot more clarity yep 
Yep. And One of my, my over, you know, I, I've been teaching at Northwestern for whatever, 20 plus years. And so all of my students, my undergraduate students and my graduate students all do an assignment. We call it, I call it the love template interview where they go into their family of origin and they talk to their attachment figures, which is usually their parents. It could be aunties and uncles and grandparents. It's usually parents. And they kind of gather their parent story. And it really is oftentimes the first time they've looked at their parent as a, as a, person, as a man, as a woman, as a son, as a daughter, as a, you know, rather than just as my parent, because we, we are myopic, right? We see our parents as our parents. And there's so much more than that. And I remember, I mean, I have thousands of these stories, but one of my students said that it was in that conversation, his dad said to him, listen, I grew up being physically abused by my father. And I knew darn well that I would never lay a hand on you. And I didn't, and I'm proud of that. But I realize now that I was not emotionally attuned mm. to you. I was not emotionally gentle with you. And that wasn't okay. So this father was able to say, like, I saw how I was raised and I did it differently, but I didn't quite make it there. And that, you know, to his 20 year old son or 25, whatever, 20 year old son was such an offering. Like it offered him the chance to see his dad as his grandpa's son. And then also to know that his dad hadn't been emotionally attuned, but also understood it, right? Recognized that he hadn't you know, given his son everything he had wanted to. And that was a big opener for my student, you know, towards forgiveness and um, continuing to see where they could go from there. Because even when we grow up, we're not done. You know, we, we've got our parents living. We can still keep renegotiating and re-experiencing them in relationship. Mm, I love that. You're so right. And you've got so many great, you've got 365, you know, sort of amazing, you know, I just look at them as like little, like expansive fortune cookie messages inside <laughs> of your, inside of your book for us. Are there a few of your favorites that you want to drop on our listeners? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I love, there's one in there. I have no idea which date it is, but, and this is, I think about this in terms of your smart daters. It's a whole entry about how to sort of reckon with the fact that when you're dating somebody, you can find yourself triggered by their past, by the, by your, the person you're dating, your, your potential partner, by your potential partner's past, that your potential partner arrives to you with a whole story of things they did, relationships they had before you. And so it's a whole entry about just kind of studying your reactions to all the places your potential partner has been before they arrived here, you know, in your life. And that's, it's not easy, but by looking at and noticing, okay, why is that threatening to me? Why am I judging that? What's my fear? It's much more interesting than just that's, I don't like that, or they shouldn't have done that, or I wish they hadn't done that. You know. Mm. I love that. I had so many thoughts whirring through my head that <laughs> they, you know, what, what I find so interesting, right? I mean, in our practice at Smart Dating Academy, we are holding people's hands date by date through this yeah. process on a weekly basis. And so sometimes when my client will tell me, well, I went on a date with this guy and he offhandedly mentioned that he cheated on his wife. Mm -hmm. Is that a red flag? Mm -hmm. I'm like, probably yes. Mm -hmm. It depends mm -hmm. on, did he mm -hmm. say, you know, was he contrite? Did he, right. Say, That's right. like, did he take responsibility for yeah. it? Or was it like, yeah, yeah, I cheated on my wife, wife, you know, can you pass the sugar? Yeah, right? That's, right. And, That's right. That's right. And so mm -hmm. if it's more past the sugar, it's totally a red flag. And to some extent I have found over the last 14 years, it's someone kind of testing you to mm -hmm. throw a little nugget like that to say, what are you going to do with that? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are you going to just accept that? Because I'm kind of telling you, right. People show us who they are. It's up to us to believe them. I'm telling you who I am at this mm -hmm. point. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so I found that to be very interesting. It's how somebody can talk yeah. about their past. Would you agree. agree with that? Oh, I agree. I agree. And I think that's a really, that's really dicey, right? Like when and how do you share with a new partner that you transgressed 
in the past. And I think that the the marker of somebody who's done their work is somebody who says, listen, I have something to tell you and I want you, uh, you should know this about me because it's part of my journey and I want you to have informed consent about whether you get in a relationship with me and here's something I did in the past and here's how I worked on it and here's what I learned and here's how I stay in my own integrity. Someone like that, I think is actually a pretty, like that to me feels like almost a green flag, certainly not a red flag, but somebody who can say like, listen, I you ought to know this about me and I, and I've worked on it. So I'm not telling you in order for you to absolve me or whatever, I have done my work on this. I know that it is, it's not the sum total of who I am. And I know that I live differently. So that I keep myself and my future partner safe, you know, but I want you to know, and it probably, I don't, I don't think it's a first date kind of a tell, but I think it's something that, you know, and all those, all those tender parts of our stories, we do have to titrate, right? It's not like we show up on the first date and I just lay out all of my skeletons, but also there may be some things where you want to give that person the sense that, you know, you ought to know this about me, not so that you can have an opinion about me, but just so that you know, this is a part of who I am. Exactly. And I think that, you know, the big highlight I would put on this is People can tell you all kinds of things. And there's one thing that will prove itself out. And that's time and repeated exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I've seen scenarios in 2023 where one of my clients was out dating and was very frank. You know, I have a dating coach and I have a dating funnel and, Mm -hmm. and the guy seemed great. And he was like, listen, but I'm not really comfortable if you're dating other people because I've been cheated on Mm -hmm. twice in the past. So, you know, if you're going to do the dating funnel thing, like best of luck to you, if you ever decide you want to explore this one-on-one, let me know. And so she was so compelled by this man's story that she got into a relationship with him. And one day he called and said, "Um, I want you to know that I cheated on you yesterday. Oh, wow. And so sometimes when we rush into things too quickly, I almost think that people that play the victim can often be the perpetrators. It's just standard projection. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so again, anybody can say anything in any way at any time, Mm -hmm. smart daters, but there's taking things slow watching who this person is date by date, interaction by interaction, slowly. Uh, You guys know, I like the course of three to four months, right? Mm. Because this is your heart and you are looking, I mean, people put more analysis into buying a damn car than they do into who they're going to date exclusively, right? So really Mm. being conscious of if you want to pick the right partner this time, and this sounds familiar to you and you have a history, being okay with slowing things down yeah. and really letting this person earn you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And her dating funnel was not an attack against him. You know, it was it was her process. It was a process that worked for her. Wow, that's a really, really compelling example. And I think that you're, that you're right. I mean, I think that it is, I could see that whole thing. Yeah. It's a really challenging story. And so for him, yeah, it was, um, he was so afraid of being hurt and he really hadn't clearly integrated the experience. He was just mostly like, don't do it to me. Don't do it to me. Oh, I did it to you. Yeah. Right. And it's probably, you know, my theory was he's probably done it to the other two and is just flipping the story because you just, you never know. Who knows? Maybe that's the case. Right. Maybe it's not the case. And yeah. even with people that are like, oh, you know, my ex girlfriend never wanted to live together, but I really do. It's like, well, let's just suspend all disbelief and see how much closer this person will get to you over the next four to six months to make sure that that isn't someone who's saying, I'm actually the one who's avoiding true commitment and Mm -hmm. being interdependent and wanting to share a life together. So in the dating world, as you know, truth is often stranger than fiction. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I hope that she comes away from that feeling, you know, aware and self-compassionate and gentle with herself and, you know, with some lessons learned. Yeah. Most lovely human she is. And there's many she's that this has happened to this year. So it's not just one. Hmm. 
old. There's yeah. many, many things that happen like this. And so my team is always like, let's just give it time. Let's see what give he or she does. Okay. Date by date, fill out your dating scorecard. What felt good, what didn't. And so with all of that, making good informed decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's right. Great. What starts fast often ends fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, you have such practical wisdom. I love that. It's my favorite thing about you. You're so darn pragmatic. <laughs> oh. No, I, right. It's, we're, we're dating in the real world. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Any yep. last gems that you want to drop on us, Dr. Solomon? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. It's so fun. I always enjoy talking to you. Oh my gosh. I love it. Well, you guys, I have the book in front of me right now called love every day. And like Alexandra said, there's something for you. There's something for everybody in this book, whether you've been married for 26 years, like me, you can find vignettes that are like, whew, okay. Mm -hmm. Made me think, or you're in between relationships, or maybe you haven't had a relationship. So there's something for everybody in this book. And I want you all to get to the space as you think about it. And I want you to think about all of the love that you already have in your life right? Sometimes we obsess about, I don't have romantic love. You have a lot of love. You have self-love and you have people that love on you. So the title of this book, Love Every Day, is something that we all aspire to do to get more love and to give more love Mm -hmm. every day, right? So I'm going to put a link to the book and support my pal, Alexandra, buy this book and through it, I hope you find love every single damn day. I just widened your title a little bit. That's, I love that. I love that. I think we got room on the cover for that. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> and it's pretty and it's like salmon yeah. and pinky colored and it feels really soft. So it's a really nice book. So Alexandra, thank you for being a two-time appearance or mm. on the podcast. And I'm sure We're going to turn this into a third time sometime soon. I'm here for it. Thanks, Bella. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you listening, if you love this episode, remember, podcasters like us, we live for your ratings and your reviews. If you like this, wherever you're getting this podcast, take a minute. All you have Mm -hmm. to do is look into the podcast. You can rate it five stars. You can write something that resonated with you because that allows us to give you more content that you love. I read every single one. So make sure you put your name in there and I'll send you a little love. So until next week, I wish you love every day.